I, I presented the prophetic mirror simply to give a third testimony to the fact that judgment begins with Adventism. The Bible says judgment begins at the house of God. Jeremiah 25 clearly identifies that judgment begins with the house of God. But so does this prophetic pattern. And um, when I drew it up here at the beginning, I left one mark out. And when I walked up here and started to explain it to you, at some point it clicked on me, I was missing a mark. And I lost my train of thought. So what we're saying here, one more time, okay, just for the record, is that there's a prophetic history. This isn't truly a chiasm. A chiasm is something that's found within the, the verses of the Bible. But nevertheless, this is a chiasm that's illustrated in prophetic history. It begins with the great Lisbon-Portugal earthquake in 1755, then the French Revolution, 1793, then the deadly wound, 1798. And I had put, 18, in your notes, this is 1840 to 1844, glorious manifestation of God. Mark that out. The glorious manifestation is 1840 when the angel comes down and it stops there. By, by extending it to 1844, I'm just adding confusion. The glorious manifestation is 1840 when the angel comes down. Then the door closed on those outside of Adventism in 1842. And then the door closed in Adventism on October 22nd, 1844. These events, they go step, 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 step until the door closes on the Millerites. These steps begin again when the door closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law. So this mark here represents both Daniel 8.14, when the door closed on the virgins of the Millerite history, and Daniel 11.41, when the door closes on the virgins today. At that point, it begins right where it started, when the door closes on God's people, and it begins to reverse itself out. The next thing we point out is Daniel 12.1, when Michael stands up and human probation closes. This is paralleling when the door closed on the Protestant churches. Okay, in both of these histories, there's two doors that closes. There's always a double cleansing. How many cleansings were there in the story of Gideon? Two. How many times did Christ cleanse the temple? Two. There's two cleansings in both these histories. In the, in the Millerite history, the first cleansing is when the Protestants closed their door. The second cleansing is when the door closed into the holy place. And it reverses back out. The first door closes at the end of the world, but judgment begins with the house of God. It closes on Adventism at the Sunday Law. And then it closes at the world when Michael stands up. As soon as Michael stands up, there is a manifestation of the power of God that you can find in Revelation 15, 8, when the heavenly sanctuary is filled with smoke. That's a manifestation of the power of God. And that is paralleling the manifestation of the power of God when the mighty angel comes down. Manifestation of the power of God, manifestation of the power of God. This history is now repeating in a reverse order. That's why we call it the prophetic mirror. Um, in Revelation 16.2, you have the drying up of the Euphrates. This is in order that the kings of the east might take down Babylon. And in 1798, you had the drying up of the Euphrates, when the papacy was taken down in order that the kings of the east might come. Um, in verse 16, you have Armageddon, an illustration of the chaos of the French Revolution. And then in verse 18 of Revelation 16, you have the great earthquake, which is the great earthquake there, which is simply a third testimony that judgment closes for Adventism first, which leads you into the fact that when this Millerite history is repeated to the very latter, that the warning message that's rejected is rejected first by Adventism and afterwards by the world. And when, when, the ba when Babylon falls, there's a warning message. When that warning message is rejected, there is a pronouncement, Babylon has fallen, that is followed by a judgment. The difficulty in conveying this truth is that probation closes progressively. All right. So when you look at the, the sequence of events in Revelation 18, you have to be very careful how you explain it to Seventh-day Adventists 
because on September 11th, 2001, the mighty angel came down and empowered the message marking the beginning of the testing time for Adventism. And then in verse 2 it says, Babylon has fallen. There is a pronouncement saying that the message has been rejected, right? Isn't that what it means when you see the pronouncement that Babylon has fallen? We had three witnesses to that. We had the Millerite history, we had the fall of Belshazzar, and we had the fall of Babylon. Message rejected, pronouncement, the fall of Babylon, followed by judgment. So in Revelation 18 verse 2, you see the pronouncement Babylon has fallen, but it is very easy to demonstrate in the Bible in the spirit of prophecy that the Sunday law does not arrive until verse 4. Because in verse 4, there's another voice that says, Come out of her, my people. And the call to come out of her takes place at the Sunday law when the church is purified. Therefore, the pronouncement in verse 2 of Revelation 18 that Babylon has fallen has something to do with the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist church has rejected the message that we're dealing with right here. And in Early Writings, page 259, Sister White, and we've read this, I've seen it read by some of the other speakers, talks about a progressive testing process in the time of Christ. Remember, those that rejected the message of John the Baptist could not be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. They went still further and crucified Christ, which prevented them to enter into the holy place. A progressive testing process in the time of Christ. As soon as Sister White finishes that paragraph, she goes into a progressive testing process in the time of the Millerites and says, those that rejected the first angel's message could not be benefited by the second angel's message, neither were they prepared to receive the midnight cry that was to prepare them to enter by faith into the most holy place. Progressive testing process here and in Christ's time is saying that there is a progressive testing process in our time period. And the progressive testing process is marked prophetically as beginning right here when the angel comes down with the book open in his hand in our next presentation we will demonstrate from from God's word why this is the case when when you're commanded to eat the little book it is marking the beginning of a testing time brothers and sisters in this reform line of Moses remember the reform line of Moses when the Lord came down and confronted when Sister White speaks about it, she calls it an angel. But in Exodus, it, um, it's the Lord that comes down and confronts Moses with the test of circumcision. Is not the Bible call circumcision a test? So when the Lord came down in the story of Moses, you have the test of circumcision. When the dove came down on Christ in that history, what did he do? He went out into the wilderness to be what? Tested of the devil. When the divine symbol comes down, the testing process is underway. What are we being tested by? We're being tested by the increase of knowledge that began back here in 1989, and it's empowered right here. We'll show you why it's empowered in just a moment. But at now, the testing process is underway. So somewhere between Revelation 18 verse 1 and Revelation 18 verse 4, a pronouncement goes out that Babylon has fallen, marking that Adventism has rejected this message. And when they reject this message, in agreement with the history of Christ and the history of the Millerites, what happened in the history of Christ to those people that flunked the test? Early Writings 259, Sister White says, But the Jews were left in total darkness. But in the history of the Millerites, those that flunked the test, she says, They were praying to Satan. And Satan answered their prayers. And those two histories are telling us what happens to you and I if we flunk this test. And Paul talks about that. We receive strong delusion. Why? Because we would not receive the love of the truth. Now, this isn't in your notes. This is from Testimonies, Volume 8, page 249. It says this. And there's a phrase in here. And this phrase, when Sister Y uses this phrase, if you've read her material very much, you know she's speaking about Seventh-day Adventists, but she's going to even identify it as Adventism further on anyway. But the phrase is, is those who have had great light. When she's talking about those that have had great light, she's talking about Seventh-day Adventists, and it says this. One who sees beneath the surface, who reads the hearts of all men, says of those who have had great light, they are afflicted and astonished because of, they are not 
afflicted and astonished because of their moral and spiritual condition. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. I will also choose their delusions, and will bring their fears upon them, because when I called, none did answer. When I spake, they did not hear, but they did evil before mine eyes, and chose that in which I delighted not. God shall send them strong delusion. Who? Those who have had great light. God shall send Seventh-day Adventists strong delusion. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Isaiah 66, 3 and 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 11, 10, and 12. And then she says this, The heavenly teacher inquired, What stronger delusion, what stronger delusion can beguile the mind than the pretense that you're building on the right foundation. Mm. And that God accepts your works when in reality you're working out many things according to worldly policy and are sinning against Jehovah. That's Testimonies, Volume 8, page 249 and 250. Oh, it is a great deception, a fascinating delusion that takes possession of minds when men who have once known the truth Mistake the form of godliness for the spirit and power thereof when they suppose that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. Who's that? That's Laodiceans. That's Adventists. While in reality they are in need of everything. She's saying that the reason that Seventh-day Adventists receive strong delusion is because they build another foundation. And in early writings, page 259, in a chapter that begins, the chapter is called what? A Firm Platform. The first paragraph of that chapter we've read in here. That's the paragraph where she speaks about the first, second, eight, third angel's message being the platform and the foundation. And she's seen people stepping off the platform saying, oh, we could make this stronger. You know that quote? We've read it here. After she introduces the foundation, and she calls it the truth, the established faith of the body. Okay? This here. After she calls this the foundation and platform, and talks about men getting off the t foundation and platform, what do you suppose the next paragraph is? It's that paragraph that says, those that rejected the testimony of John could not be, be benefited by the teachings of Jesus. And the next paragraph is, is those that rejected the first angel's message could not be benefited by the, the second angel's message. In other words, she's saying that when the progressive testing process takes place here at the end of the world, that part of that test is going to be about the foundations of Adventism. And those people that flunk the test, they receive strong delusion because they built a different foundation. Do you see it? You see it? So, so brothers and sisters, I want you to understand, from my understanding, the only way that you can identify that Islam marks the beginning of the latter reign, and Islam does mark the beginning of the latter reign, the only way that you can do that is if you're standing on the foundations of Adventism. If you throw the pioneer understanding of the trumpets out, forget about it. You're on a wrong foundation. Brothers and sisters, in this history here, a testing process begins, and in this time period, you and I have the privilege to bring our life into agreement with the high calling of being among those that receive the seal of God, and possibly among those that are the 144,000 when it's all said and done and Michael stands up. But in this history, before the Sunday Law, those people that reject this message received the strong delusion of 2 Thessalonians. And when Sister White's commenting about it, she says, I will choose their delusions. Which means, I may choose to place the trumpets off in the future. There's my delusion. You may choose some other foolish wind that's blowing through doctrine. And he may choose some other foolish wind that's blowing through doctrine, through Adventism. And we're going to reap exactly what we sowed. The, the, the delusions that the Lord chooses for these people that are lost is delusions in the plural. But they all come from rejecting the foundational truths of Adventism. Now, <clears throat> I've, I've finished what I wanted to say. Last time we are on page 234 of your notes. In... In two, page 233, you have the commentary that Sister White has on Revelation chapter 10. I have it in there just for the record. 
I have some of the points about Revelation 10 that I've drawn out of that passage on 234 from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 971. On the top of page 235, I've summarized the points out of that passage that I want to start with. Daniel stood in his lot during this history. He sees a little book unsealed. It's in this history that the first, second, and angel's messages are, are unfolded to God's people. The message for the Millerites was the message in relation to time, okay? And uh, the glad reception of the truth. If you, re if you receive this message and it makes you happy and you get excited about it, I, there was a brother giving testimony to that within the past five minutes. And that is represented as it being sweet in your mouth. Okay, that's, that's what that means. It's sweet in your mouth. Um, so, with, with those thoughts in mind, I want to start addressing a little bit why Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the third angel's message. Okay, you, you may not be aware of it, but when you take this message to Adventism, many of the modern theologians, some of them specifically say, Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is not the third angel's message. But brothers and sisters, Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is the third angel's message, period. Yeah. That, it is the third angel's message for abundant reasons. We're going to look at a few of them. This first one is very, in my mind, very important to see. From Great Controversy 334, 335, I know we've read this. When Josiah Litch made the prediction about the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, and Sister White comments, comments on it in Great Controversy, that first quote there on your notes. Everyone see that quote? Notice what what's in bold face. When it became known, when it became known that the Ottoman Empire collapsed just like it was supposed to on August 11th, 1840, multitudes were convinced of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. One of the things that, that took place on August 11th, 1840, and, and I think you need to understand this, I could be wrong, is that the rules of prophetic interpretation adopted by William Miller were confirmed. It, it, that's what made it sweet. They'd been, they'd been presenting this message for many years, and suddenly the most important component of their message, the year-day principle, look at how much of their message is based upon the year-day principle. It was confirmed. It was sweet. You know, they've been opposing this for many years now, but you know what? What we've been saying about the year-day principle, it works. It was sweet in their mouth, August 11, 1840. Do you see that? Amen. Now, underneath that, you have the quote, I'm often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter. This is a fulfillment of the parable of the ten virgins, the Millerites here. It's going to be repeated to the very letter in the history of the 144,000. So when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 came down on September 11, 2001, what should it do? It should confirm the primary rule of prophetic interpretation that the 144,000 are using. That's what it should do, should it not? It's going to be fulfilled to the very letter. When this angel come down, the rules the Millerites was, were using was confirmed, was it not? So when this history is repeated, the rule that's, that's making this message work should be confirmed, should it not? And what's the rule that this whole message is built upon? It's built upon the fact that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. If that isn't part of this message, this message is just fluff. Brothers and sisters, this, that's what you've seen in Pastor Carrasco's presentation is that every reform movement is identical to every other reform movement and therefore when you bring them all together it's illustrating exactly the movements of the latter rain and the 144,000. This is, this is the primary principle of this message. How was it confirmed? How was it confirmed? Well, we've got the quote that we've read more than once about Revelation 18 verses 1 through 3 being fulfilled when the great buildings of New York City come down. Brothers and sisters, it does not matter if it was the Jesuits or George Bush or the CIA or the globalists or Islam that brought down the Twin Towers. It was Islam, but it doesn't matter. What matters was 
is that when the angel came down in 1840, it came down when Islam was restrained. Islam was restrained. Prophetically, historically, and the pioneers marked it. The prophecy that Islam was loosed in 391, Pastor Jamal said so, and in 1840, Islam was restrained. You remember when he was teaching that? But also, in history, the four great powers of Europe, on August 11, 1840, that's what they did. They restrained Islam from the war they were starting. There was a historical restraint put on Islam. There was a prophetic restraint put upon Islam. And it doesn't matter who brought down the Twin Towers. Look at the next page. You all know this. We got a quote in here from our last president. Every nation in the region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us, or you're with the terrorists. Immediately after September 11, 2001, there was a restraint placed upon Islam. It don't matter who brought down the Twin Towers. Brothers and sisters, you're American citizens, you got your TVs, you got your radios and your newspapers. Was there or was there not a restraint placed upon Islam? Brothers and sisters, that's confirming that the Millerite history is repeating to the very letter, and that's the principle that empowers this message. See it? Two things then to see. Two things to see. The rules adopted by Miller and his associates were confirmed when Islam was con restrained, and Islam was restrained. When this history was repeated, Islam was restrained, and the rules of prophetic interpretation that empowers this message was confirmed. Most Adventists won't, won't receive it. Particularly if, if you're following uh, the teachings of the, one of the primary theologians, someone like, say, John Pauline. Okay, he, he places the, the trumpets at the end of the world. He throws out the trumpets of, of the Millerite understanding. He throws it out. You can't see that. If you, if you don't accept the pioneer understanding of the trumpets, brothers and sisters, you can't see that the Millerite history is repeating and that Islam was restrained in fulfillment of prophecy. It can't be done. And most of us in Adventism, we ain't studying. We aren't studying. We're not studying. <laughs> some of us are following the theologians, and some of us are following these other foolish winds of doctrines, but just a few of us that are even looking. But if we don't see this, brothers and sisters, Lord willing, before we get out of there this week, we're going to show you. I'll show you where I disagree a little bit with, with Pastor Taylor and a little bit with, uh, was it Pastor Carrasco? One of them, I heard it. I don't disagree. I agree, but I want to say it a little bit differently. The message of the east and the north in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Daniel 11, verse 44. There's a message from the east and the north that enrages the papacy. Everything that we say about those messages is correct. I agree with them 100%. But you know what? The message of the east in Daniel 11, 40 to 44, it's the message of Islam. And the ascending angel in Revelation 7, the sealing angel that ascends from the east, what that's representing is that he ascends with the message that is the children of the East, which is Islam. Islam is what brings the seal of God and the latter rain to God's people. You have to see that. It is the sealing message. Islam's the children of the East. They're the message of the East that enrages the papacy. Why would our understanding of Islam, why would a few Seventh-day Adventists out of 14 million or whatever, understanding the role of Islam in Bible prophecy enrage the papacy? Because the people that understand it, they're the ones that are recognizing the latter reign, and they're beginning to give the loud cry message. And as they do so, you know what they're doing? They're giving the other half of the message. What's the other half of the message? The North. The message of the North, the message of the East and the North, it's the message of the papacy and Islam. And if you receive the message of Islam and receive the latter rain, you're going to be among those that are eventually identifying who the Pope of Rome is and what his activities are. And I guarantee, brothers and sisters, you can't do that effectively without the latter rain, which means you can't do it without understanding Islam, the children of the East. So it's for this reason that the papacy hates this message because this is the message designed to empower God's people to bring Babylon down. Amen. It is. And I, we hope to show you that before we get out of here. 
But what history is repeating? They were the messengers of the first angel's message. We are the messenger of the third angel's message. They announced the opening of the judgment. We announced the close of the judgment. It's the same history. It's the same message. Daniel 8.14 was their message. It announced the opening of the judgment. Daniel 11.40-45 announces the close of the judgment. It's the same message. It's the third angel's message. They can't be separated. In, on page 236, we have a quote from Great Controversy 6.11. It says, the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. A work of worldwide extent and unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 1844 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. Same histories. Sister White then has two passages, after, or a passage after this, from Manuscript Releases, Volume 16, where... She comments on the history of the Millerites fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins. She puts it in that context and then she ties it into Revelation 18. I'll take it up in the second paragraph where it says a similar work will be accomplished when that other angel represented in Revelation 18 gives his message. A similar work. In the previous paragraph, she's described the parable of the ten virgins. So she's saying the parable of the ten virgins is going to be similar to what takes place when Revelation 18 is fulfilled. She, there she says the first, second, third angel's messages will need to be repeated. She quotes from Revelation 18 verses 2 through 5. And then she says, take each verse of this chapter of Revelation 18 and read it carefully, especially the last two. And she quotes them. And then she goes back into the parable of the ten virgins and she says, the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself and every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will be shut. Now brothers and sisters, it's, I don't have the time to explain this. I don't know that I could do it well anyway. But as I've had the privilege of presenting this message for many, many years now, I've watched certain arguments arise concerning this message. And there's one argument that always comes up. It comes up in a variety of ways. And it's this. Probation doesn't really close for Seventh-day Adventists at the Sunday Law. Okay, you know, God is more merciful than that. But brothers and sisters, that's a, that's a lie from Satan. There's a lot of ways that, that that lie is thrown out there. But what I want you to see in this quote, when Sister White's talking about the parable of the ten virgins in Revelation 18, especially the last two verses in it, what she's emphasizing is that this history, this prophetic history, this message is about the close of probation. When she mentions the parable of the ten virgins, she's saying a time will come when the door will be shut. Our message is about the close of probation. And you know what? Probation closes for us first as Adventists. Nobody wants to receive that, but it's true. So if you can see here the last two verses of Revelation 18, and John draws that from Jeremiah 16. You have that in your notes on the top of page 237. And what I'm getting at here, brothers and sisters, is this history here. William Miller's message was about the close of probation, and our message is about the close of probation. These histories are repeated. This is, this is what I'm trying to demonstrate here, is that it's the same message. It's a repetition. William Miller was announcing the close of probation. We are. But notice, notice this passage from Jeremiah, which is where John draws the last two verses of Revelation 18 from. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your... I will cause to... Cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. And it shall come to pass. Now, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is when you look at that phrase closely that's there and that's in Revelation 18 and you see how Sister White just used it in this quote and in other places, this is when the voice of the bridegroom and the bride and the voice of mirth ends, it's a symbol of the close of probation. That's what it's identifying. Okay, Revelation 18 starts in verse 1 on 9-11, and Revelation 18 continues until probation closes. Those last two verses are the close of probation. The first verse is September 11th, and those verses are telling what takes place as human probation closes. In verse 4, you have the Sunday Law. And from verse 4 to those last two verses, you have the Sunday Law testing time that follows as every person's tested by that issue. Okay, but notice what... But Jeremiah says about it, and it shall come to pass 
when you shall show the people all these words. What words? It shall come to pass when you show these people the message about the close of probation. We're supposed to be teaching this message. Jeremiah's speaking about the end of the world more than the time than what he lived, right? He's just talking about the close of probation, about the, the end of the, the mirth, the end of the bridegroom, the end of the bride. And then he says, It'll, it shall come to pass when you shall show this people all these wor words and they shall say unto thee, Where have, Wherefore hath thou the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Oh, brother Jeff, there's no way the Lord would close probation upon his people at the Sunday law. He's too merciful for that. It shall come to pass, when you show the people these things, they will say to you, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord? Then thou shalt say unto them, Because we rejected the Holy Spirit in 1888, Because your fathers have forsaken me, said the Lord, and have walked after other gods and served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, and today, and ye have done worse than your fathers. For behold, you walk everyone after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Is that what it says? It says, therefore I will cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers, and there ye shall serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. Hmm. Therefore, behold, the days cometh, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but the Lord liveth, that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them and I will bring them again into their land and I gave that I gave unto their fathers. You know how you would read this today? Therefore it will no longer be said that the Lord brought a people out of the dark ages from 538 to 1798 but that the Lord brought a people out of the scattering of William Miller's dream. If you can understand that. Pastor, J Pastor Jamal will deal with that later and try to bring that into focus for you because there was a scattering that preceded this history, brothers and sisters. The scattering of the 2520. Therefore, there's going to be a scattering that precedes our history and the scattering that precedes our history is the scattering of William Miller's dream. Brothers and sisters, the third angel's message is a message that's identifying the close of probation. But, so is Miller's. You can see a quote down here below from early writings where she's commenting on the first angel's message starting in the bold face. It says, Satan in the Millerite history was leading very many to look far into the future for the great events connected with the judgment and the end of probation. The deception that Satan was trying to work in the Millerite history was to have people disregard what Miller was saying and look for the close of probation way off far down the line. So what was Miller saying? Miller was saying probation was about to close. And this history is repeated in our history. And what's great controversy say about our history? The events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are obscure. Is that what it says? Are clearly presented. Now, brothers and sisters, I've had people and recently Brother Eric in here can give testimony of this. We were having Bible study in his home in Michigan within the past six weeks, seven weeks, I don't know, recently. And there was a brother that, I mean, no matter how we labored with this, this brother, he was saying this was for people outside of Adventism, and I just challenge you to break open the great controversy and see the paragraph that leads into it. She says, Jesus told the disciples what was going to take place, but because of their preconceived ideas, they couldn't see what was going to take place. She says, so too now. And then she goes into this 
paragraph where she says, the events connected with the close of probation and the work of preparation for the time of trouble are clearly presented, but multitudes have no more understanding of these important truths than if they'd never been revealed. Satan watches to catch away every impression that would make them wise unto salvation. In other words, brothers and sisters, the events connected with the close of probation are salvational, and the events connected with the close of probation are the last six verses of Daniel 11. They're salvational. If Satan catches that truth away from you, you're lost. Is that how you read that? That's pretty. The, the theologians can't rework that for us. That's not Greek or Hebrew. That's English, brothers and sisters. <laughs> when God stands on notice, the events connected with the Kozobration are the last six verses of Daniel 11. Notice the next paragraph. I'm on the bottom of page 237. It says, when God sends men warnings so important that they're represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. Brothers and sisters, Sister White just said the events connected with the close of probation is the third angel's message. And the events connected with the close of probation are the last six verses of Daniel 11. It's the third angel's message. And it's the message that identifies the close of probation. It's the message that parallels Miller's message. Because these histories are repeated to the very letter. Another thing the third angel's message is. I'm on page 238 now. Under the last scene, Selected Messages, book 2, page 102. The scenes connected with the working of the man of sin. Who's the working of the man of sin? Who's the man of sin? Papacy. Who's the papacy? Catholic. Catholic. Who's the Catholic? Who's the Antichrist? Oh, I heard it. Who said that? It's the King of the North. The scenes connected with the King of the North are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. The people now have a special message to give to the world. The third angel's message? The third angel's message is the message of the King of the North. Amen. You see it? If you see it, say amen, brothers and sisters. You may not be aware of how many people in Adventism fight the idea that the last six verses is the third angel's message. But it is. There was an increase of knowledge in this history when the book of Daniel was unsealed. There's an increase of knowledge in this history when the understanding of the seven thunders was unsealed. Sister White speaks about an increase of knowledge in Selected Messages, Book 2, 106-107. We've read it before. The first paragraph says this. The book that was sealed was not the book of Revelation, but that portion of Daniel which related to the last days. What's the last days? The end of the world. Where do we see the end of the world most clearly identified in the book of Daniel? Yeah, in Daniel 12, 1, Michael stands up, human probation closes, the, the great time of trouble, the seven last plagues, and the return of Jesus is there in Daniel 12. So the last six verses of Daniel 11, that's the portion of Daniel that was sealed up until the last days. Now how was that unsealed to the Millerites? Maybe we'll get time to deal with that, but notice... That portion of, the, of Daniel which related to the last days, the scripture says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. When the book was opened, the proclamation was made, time shall be no longer. The book of Daniel is now unsealed, and the revelation made by Christ to John is to come to all the inhabitants of the earth. By the increase of knowledge, a people is to be prepared to stand in the latter days. Increase of knowledge prepared the Millerites. There's going to be an increase of knowledge to prepare us to stand in the latter days. And Pastor Carrasco used this last paragraph in one of his slide presentations two or three times ago. And it says, In the first angel's message, men are called upon to worship God, our Creator who made the world and all things that are therein. They have paid homage to an institution of the papacy, making of no effect the law of Jehovah. But there is to be in an increase of knowledge on this subject on what subject? Upon the papacy and the Sunday law and the increase of knowledge that is contained in that portion of the book of Daniel that relates to the last days. That increase of knowledge comes from the last six verses of Daniel 11 and it's going to be an increase of knowledge about the papacy and the Sunday law. And what do you know? The king of the north in the last six verses of Daniel 11 is the papacy and it's warning us now that the very next thing to happen is the Sunday law in the United States. The increase of knowledge, brothers and sisters, 
is the third angel's message. It's the last six verses of Daniel 11. Now, I heard Pastor Taylor deal with this subject. Testimonies, Volume 6, page 165. Placing the Bible in their hands, he continued, You have little knowledge of this book. You know not the scriptures, nor the power of God, nor do you understand. Now remember, brothers and sisters, when there's an increase of knowledge, who understands? What? Is there a group that doesn't understand? <laughs> Placing the Bible in their hands, he continued, you have little knowledge of this book. Little what? Is there supposed to be an increase of knowledge? How important is it? What's Hosea 4 or 6 say? My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Is Hosea 4 or 6 speaking about the end of the world? Yes. Placing the Bible in their hands, he continued, you have little knowledge of this book. You know not the scriptures nor the power of God, nor do you understand the deep importance of the message to be born to a perishing world. The time past has shown that both teachers and students know very little in regard to the awful truths which are now our living issues for this time. Should the third angel's message be proclaimed in all lines to many who stand as educators, it would not be understood by them. Next quote, very similar. She just reworked it in one of them. The, the one we just read is probably the one that was reworked. Top of page 239. This is the work God has given to every teach, teacher. As educators, you have not that knowledge that comes from God. Had you this knowledge, your whole being would proclaim the truth of the living God to a world dead in trespasses and sins. You know not the message God has given for this time. You are as blind leading the blind. Students, have, students leave this school with false education. I live by an Adventist school, and I go to churches where those students come in and teach sermons to help support the Sabbath service. What? And they come in and they te present sermons on Sabbath to help support the churches in their area and it breaks your heart. Those students, they get up there and they present truth and you're sitting there wiggling in your seat saying, oh man, you got a door opened here for this sleeping church that you could present present truth and wake them up but they've been educated. Truth, 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 truth on one hand. On, on the other hand, they're getting educated that any time a, a sentence comes up supporting present truth, they've been trained on how to combat it. And you know not the message is God God has given for this time you are as blind men leading the blind. Students leave the school with a false education which it, which it takes them years to unlearn. Students do not have years to unlearn error. Probation is closing. The past has shown that both teachers and students know very little in regard to the messages should, which should be proclaimed at this time. Should the third angel's message be proclaimed in all its line to many who profess to be educated, it would not be understood by them. Next quote, the peculiar work of the third angel has not been seen in its importance. The middle of the paragraph, not all of our ministers who are giving the third angel's message really understand what constitutes that message. Do you believe that Ellen White is inspired? Do you believe that this is true? Last part that's bold-faced, what interpretation do they give to the passage which says an angel descended from heaven and the earth was lightened with its glory? Brothers and sisters, she's saying, if you know what the third angel's message is, then you're going to have an interpretation about when the angel of Revelation 18 descends. She's saying, he's talking about a group of people that don't know what the third angel's message is, even though they profess to teach it to others. And she challenges them, with, what's your interpretation about the mighty angel coming down in Revelation 18? And the implication is, they don't know anything about it. In other words, it's something that someone that's giving the third angel's message is supposed to know about. In fact, it is our sign. You realize every generation has signs. Adventists know we have signs. We all know that the Sunday law is the sign to leave the larger cities to the smaller ones, right? So we, we know we have signs. What we don't usually recognize is that we have a sign that's life or death before the Sunday law. And that sign is to recognize that the latter rain is falling. Every generation has signs. Okay, so Miller's message, the first angel's message, it was a message about the close of probation. When it was empowered, the rules that they were using were confirmed. 
Islam was restrained. There was an increase of knowledge in that history. The third angel's message has to do with the papacy. Now we're on the bottom of page 239. Miller brought a warning, a message of reform. You can see that from Great Controversy 309. I'm on the bottom of page 239. And you can see that we also have the same message as William Miller. The message here is the same message as here. It's a message of reform. This is where I was tongue in cheek saying I disagreed with Pastor Taylor when, when he was saying that, that this truth if you have this truth, you have no fear. This is true. But this message, the first time you hear it, it's designed to put fear in your heart, the kind of fear that the Holy Spirit can use to bring you to the foot of the cross, that you can secure that perfect peace where there is no fear. And Miller, the first angel's message, was that fearful message. You can see a quote from early writings, page 233, and then from Great Controversy, Great Controversy 450, it says this, concerning the third angel's message, which is our message. The most fearful threatening ever addressed to mortals is contained in the third angel's message. And brothers and sisters, when we in Adventism in our Laodicean condition dissect the first angel's message and say, fear God means to reverence God, the first angel's message means it's a message that convicts you of your lost condition and it's a fearful message. It convicts you of the fact that you don't have the ability to reverence God. You don't know how to reverence God. You're lost and until you come to the foot of the cross and obtain the grace there that you can obtain if you meet the conditions of the gospel, you can't reverence God. That's a Laodicean wives' tale. The third angel's message is also the Laodicean message. Notice the most fearful message ever addressed to mortals is contained in the third angel's message from Great Controversy. But in the next quote from Testimonies, Volume 1, she's speaking of the Laodicean message. And the first bold faced sentence says, This fearful message will do its work. The third angel's message, which is the last six verses of Daniel 11, is also the message to Laodicea. It's the message to Laodicea, brothers and sisters. Notice what it says further on in the paragraph. It is designed to arouse the people of God. Did all the virgins sleep, wise and foolish? What's it mean to arouse? To wake them up. This is the wake up message, brothers and sisters. It's designed to arouse the people of God, to discover them their backslidings and to lead to zealous repentance that they may be favored with the presence of Jesus and be fitted for the loud cry of the third angel's message. Brothers and sisters, the third angel's message, the warning message, is the Laodicean message. The last six verses of Daniel 11 is the Laodicean message. If you understand correctly the last six verses of Daniel 11, what it's saying is that verse 40 was fulfilled in 1989 with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the next thing to happen is a Sunday law in the United States and a as a Seventh-day Adventist, your probation closes. You either wake up or die. It's fearful. It's designed to wake you up. Now notice at the bottom of page 240, the message given to us by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner is the message of God to the Laodicean church. Ah, they were the messengers of the latter rain, the messenger of the third angel's message, they also were teaching the Laodicean message. Right? Notice what she says on the top of the page from Testimonies to Ministers, page 91, top of our page 241. The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through elders Wagner and Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior. H how, is it, how is it that Jones and Wagner brings the uplifted Savior before a human being. There's only one way, brothers and sisters, there's only one way to see the uplifted Savior. There's only one way to see the uplifted Savior. You know what it is? You have to be humbled into the dust at the foot of the cross. And when you're there, you, you ever been in a, a, a building that 
that has holes in its roof when it's raining or somewhere like that and suddenly you're, you're filling drips of water on you and you, you, you fill them and then you look around to see what it is and you look up. Jones and Wagner's message, the Laodicean message, the last six verses of Daniel 11 is designed to bring a Laodicean Seventh-day Adventist face down in the dust at the foot of the cross and when he's there he's going to start feeling something dripping on him. And it's the blood. And he's going to look up and see the uplifted Savior. And that's what Jones and Wagner's message was to do. It was to bring more prominently before the people the uplifted Savior. Amen. They had to see it. You don't see the uplifted Savior from standing there like this, brothers and sisters. You see Him from being at the foot of the cross. But you know what? When Jones and Wagner brought that message, the brethren refused to see it. Amen. What was that message? What was that message in connection with this? It was the first step. It was the fearful warning message. It was the warning message. It, the reform message. The message that convicts you of sin. And the brethren said, no, no we don't, we're not going to take that. That's why there was no manifestation of righteousness. That's why it never led to judgment. They refused the first step. They refused to go to the foot of the cross. And they prevented the Holy Spirit from being poured out upon them. Now notice the next, the next quotes, like the Messages, book 1, page 362. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning Redeemer. This is the end of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole work. Jones and Wagner's message was the end. It was the beginning. Was it the work of the Holy Spirit? What's the work of the Holy Spirit? It's threefold. To convict of sin. What's the beginning? To convict of sin. That's all Jones and Wagner got to. They just got to the beginning. And it was not received. Amen. Notice the next quote. I'm doing it again. An unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Jones and Wagner. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy pre prevented them from obtaining that efficiency. They had to obtain the efficiency. That's the efficiency. Next quote. Instead of stimulating doubt, strengthening faith by every word, attitude, and practice, make known that we have a living Savior, a real spiritual life to receive and to impart. Guide others who are now on sliding sand to plant their feet on solid rock. There are souls, who, souls to be what? Revived. Many receive the joy to receive the joy of salvation into their own souls. They have erred. They are not building a right character. But God has joy to restore to them, even the joy of His anointed. This will give efficiency and happiness and sanctified assurance, a living testimony. What do we have to have to have efficiency? We have to be revived. What revives us? The message that convicts us of sin and presents before us an uplifted Savior. The brethren would not receive it. 1888 is an illustration of today, brothers and sisters. Jones and Wagner's message is the Laodicean message. The last six verses of Daniel 11 is the last six verses. The midnight cry message in this history. Am I in trouble, Brother Glenn? Okay, two minutes. In this history, there was a midnight cry message. It was brought by Samuel Snow. The characteristics of the midnight cry message were this, brothers and sisters. It was new light. When Samuel Snow came to the Exeter camp meeting here in August of 1844, he had new light was the midnight cry. The new light was new light directly connected for the message of the hour. The message of the hour was Daniel 8.14, identifying the 2300 years. The new light of Samuel Snow was identifying specifically the starting point, therefore allowing them to identify specifically the ending point. It wasn't just 1844 anymore. It was October 22, 1844. So the message of the midnight cry has 
three, but the first two components to it. It's new light on the message of the hour. The third component is, is when that new light was fulfilled in history on October 22nd, 1844, the door closed. The last six verses of Daniel 11 are the midnight cry message for Adventism today. Why? Because it's new light on the very message of the hour, and when it's fulfilled in history, the door closes. What's the message of the hour? The message of the hour is the third angel's message, a warning about receiving the mark of the beast. The new light, it's not Revelation 13, 11. We've always known that at some time and point in history, the United States was going to speak as a dragon. That's the new light. The new light is Daniel 11, 40 and 41, which says, in 1989, verse 40 was fulfilled, and the next thing to happen is the Sunday Law. That's new light for Adventism, but it's directly connected to the message of the hour because it's identifying when the mark of the beast comes into play. That is our message. That's the third angel's message. And when it's fulfilled in history, brothers and sisters, the door closes on Adventism. The last six verses of Daniel 11 is the third angel's message. It's the Laodicean message. It's the message brought by Jones and Wagner. It's the midnight crime message, and it's the message of present truth that's designed to awake the foolish virgins and give them the power to stand up and reflect Christ's character to, to a dying world in the crisis that's just about to hit. But before they can participate in that, they have to come to the foot of the cross, and what brings them to the foot of the cross is the revelation that we're now in the judgment of the living and probation's about to close. And if you play, along, play, play any longer with your sins, your secret sins, and your darling idols, you're going to be lost. There's never been a more fearful message than this ever before. And brothers and sisters, it can be demonstrated from all over the Word of God. Yeah. We're here. This is it. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we wish to allow your Holy Spirit to bring the conviction upon each of our hearts necessary to accomplish the transformation within us that would allow you to use us as powerful tools to help finish this work on planet Earth. We wish to be finished with this world of sin, go home and live with you for eternity, but we wish for our friends and families that are not seeing and understanding these truths to be awakened also. And we know that this can only happen through a work of your Holy Spirit. So we ask that you would do whatever it takes to make us fit vessels that your Holy Spirit might help us to cause this awakening and those souls that you've assigned us to reach. We thank you for the, the time we've had here on this mountaintop so far. I ask for your continued blessing, your con your continued protection. And we ask that in this small break you would refresh our minds and prepare us um, for the next presentation in Jesus' name. Amen.